Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Isabella Oakshop. Lots coming up, including the government's new plan to get a grip of the migrant crisis, but will it work? Plus, I'll speak to the president of Botswana about whether countries like the UK are giving enough COVID vaccines to Africa. But first, it's time for the news with Rhiannon Jones. I'm Rhiannon Jones. This is your news at 12 o'clock. Counter-terrorism police have confirmed that the bomb which exploded outside the Liverpool Women's Hospital on Sunday had been packed with ball bearings. They say it could have caused significant injury or death had it exploded in the way the bomber intended. Detectives are examining the possibility that the motion of the taxi stopping suddenly may have caused the improvised device to detonate prematurely. Police have also spoken to the brother of the bomber, Imad al Swalamin. An investigation is underway following the deaths of two women and two children after a house fire in south-east London. Firefighters managed to pull all four people from the property in Bexley Heath, but they died at the scene. A man who got out before firefighters arrived was taken to hospital. The fire is not thought to be suspicious. The UK is banning Hamas, designating it a terrorist organisation. The move brings British policy in line with the EU and the US. Supporters of the Palestinian Islamist group could face up to 10 years in prison. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, says Hamas has significant terrorist capability, including access to extensive and sophisticated weaponry and terrorist training facilities. COVID booster jabs have been added to the travel pass. Millions of people who've had three doses will be able to prove their status with the NHS app from midday. It means from now, in fact, it means people can visit countries where vaccinations are only valid for a certain amount of time without having to quarantine. The government wasn't fully prepared for the wide-ranging impacts of the pandemic and failed to learn from simulation exercises. That's according to a new report. The National Audit Office says there were no detailed plans on shielding, job support schemes or school disruption. It also found that crisis planning had been limited, with most of the government's emergency resources focused on mitigating a no-deal Brexit. You go through simulations, um, but... Yeah, nothing prepares you for what happened here. This was what was called a novel pathogen. That meant that, that no one really in, knew what it was. No one expected it to come. And when it arrived, we didn't really understand its transmission. I mean, it's only recently, really, we've got in, into this sort of airborne transmission understanding and the importance of ventilation. So I, 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 don't, think, I don't think we were prepared for that. British troops are being deployed to Poland's border with Belarus to help tackle the migrant crisis. A hundred military engineers will provide practical support and work to reinforce the perimeter. Thousands of people have been gathering along the border in freezing temperatures over the last few weeks. The EU has accused Belarus of deliberately creating the crisis, which Minsk denies. A Croatian lorry driver has been jailed for six years for attempting to smuggle cocaine with a street value of £1.6 million into the UK. Predrag Gojic was stopped at Dover's Eastern Docks in May with 20 kilograms of cocaine hidden inside reels of paper. He told officers he planned to take the drugs to Leicester for a payment of €10,000. UK retail sales rose by 0.8% in October, boosted by early Christmas trading. It ends a five-month run of falling or flat sales. The Office for National Statistics says second-hand items, toys and sports equipment sold particularly well. Maybe some of that second-hand stores is people thinking a little more environmentally about their purchases. There was also solid sales for clothing and footwear. Uh, as people are starting to go out a little more, as the economy continues to open up further. And in fact, it's interesting that UK football is the highest of any of the major EU economies and higher than the US, which is you know, a really refreshing figure to see at the moment. From next autumn, schools in England will be required to help keep uniform costs down. They'll be instructed to remove unnecessary branded items under new Department for Education guidance. Schools will also have to make sure second-hand uniforms are available. I'll have the latest headlines for you in half an hour. Now it's back to the briefing with Isabel Oakeshott.
coming up this hour on The Briefing. How many times have been told that the government has got a grip of the migrant crisis? And yet a tidal flow of people are still arriving across the channel, with 23,000 making the journey just this year. So will the government's latest genius idea to process these people in Albania stem the tide of arrivals? And bad news on the COVID front in Europe, Austria is going to enter a full national lockdown. And they're going even further on mandatory vaccines than any other country in the world. I'm going to be speaking to somebody who has been in the country earlier this week. Plus, I'll be bringing you GB News' first ever presidential interview. Let's hope first of many. I'll speak to the president of Botswana about whether countries like the UK are giving enough vaccines to Africa. And as always, give me your political briefing. Send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. Now, how many times have, have you been told that the government has got a grip of the migrant crisis in the channel? How many times have you heard them say that this has got to stop, that this is going to stop, and that they've negotiated some brilliant deal with the French who are going to do their bit to stop the people smugglers and their dinghies full of desperados? Well, in case you've lost count, here's a few examples of the time that Home Secretary Priti Patel has told us she's got this and it's all under control. The UK government is working with law enforcement and intelligence networks to address the issue of illegal migrations and the cross-channel trafficking of migrants. Um, our work is continuing and we're also arresting and prosecuting those responsible for the illegal trafficking of people. Well, this will make a difference and in fact the joint agreement that I signed which secured the joint intelligence um, operation has made a difference even in the last six months and we have seen that. So we know that the French authorities have stopped over 5,000 migrants from crossing into the United Kingdom. We've had hundreds of arrests and on top of that we are now sharing in terms of toughening up our border security. So on the French side in particular they are now focused on strengthening their border security because we are seeing fewer migrants now in small boats, but we're seeing displacement into other areas such as lorries. Well, Mr Speaker, it's absolutely right that we have made changes to our immigration rules and he will specifically know, and I hope he recognises, that when it comes to illegal migrations and the issues that we face, too many people are putting their lives at risk, crossing the channel in unseaworthy vessels, and not only are they putting their lives at risk, they put the lives of Border Force officers at risk as well, and we are determined to make that route unviable, and as a result, these rule changes are a part of that. And I will not apologise for being abundantly clear that an illegal journey to the UK is not worth the risk. And that is what this plan is about. It is about tackling illegal migration, protecting lives, and of course, alongside that, creating new routes. We are now addressing the challenge of illegal migration head on. I'm introducing the most significant overhaul of our asylum system in decades. A new comprehensive, fair but firm long-term plan. The British people have had enough of open borders and uncontrolled immigration. Yeah. Enough of a failed asylum system that costs the taxpayer over a billion pounds a year. Enough of dinghies arriving illegally on our shores directed by organised crime gangs. Enough of people drowning on these dangerous, illegal and unnecessary journeys. And so for the first time in decades we will determine who comes in and out of our country. And at long last, the British immigration system is under the control of the British government. And I make no apology for securing our borders and exploring all possible options to save lives by ending these horrific journeys. Which is why, right from the start, Boris and I have worked intensively with every institution with the responsibility to protect our borders. Border Force, the police, the National Crime Agency, maritime experts, and yes, the military, to deliver operational solutions, including new sea tactics, which we are working to implement to turn back the boats. Well, it all sounded brilliant, didn't it? Listening to all of that a year ago, you might have felt reassured. You might have felt that the so-called party of law and order 
was going to end the tidal flow of people coming from who knows where, rocking up on our shores with nowhere to go, waiting to be looked after courtesy of the British taxpayer. Well, you'd have been wrong. So far this year, 23,000 migrants have crossed the channel. On one day alone this week, over a thousand people came over in boats from France and the government seems completely incapable of sorting it out. Now, I don't know about you, but I find the utter incompetence of this all breathtaking. I think the French are laughing at us. We are throwing money at them to help and they're just pocketing the cash and sending more of these people on our way. The government's latest genius idea is to let these people come to the UK and then fly them to a processing centre in Albania. The cost of this completely batty scheme would be £100,000 per migrant. So 10,000 migrants will be a great deal of money. Uh, each time a migrant would cost that amount of money to process in Albania. You get the picture. So several million a week, I would have thought, would be the cost of that. And apparently the Albanian government is pretty keen on the idea, no surprise there. Who can blame them? But what about Albanian citizens? How would they react? With me to discuss whether this is a good idea from an Albanian perspective is Arlinda Balchai, an Albanian who lives in Shrewsbury and is a Conservative Party activist. Arlinda, thanks for joining us. What do you think of this idea of sending migrants who've crossed the channel to the UK in planes to Albania to process them? Isabel, thank you for having me today. And yes, it's a very sensitive topic last few days. And I'm really hoping that this is not the true news. This is just the fake news. Because if it is true, that will be very dis disappointing, devastating and heartbreaking. Because these 23,000 asylum seekers that might be from Afghanistan, Syria, they put their lives in risk, their families in risk they cross the channel or maybe they travel in refrigerated uh, vans to come to this great country because they believe and the history showed that britain and britons are great people and fantastic country and literally no one has the right to deport these people or processing as they're trying to say to albania and uh, I see this not just as an Albanian citizen, because I moved from Albania nearly 18 years ago to England. I see this as a British citizen too, because I'm a taxpayer like yourself, like millions of people in this country. Would I want to be with my contribution to this country part of this crime? Would I want to trade these immigrants, asylum seekers, they looking for a better life, they're looking for a safe life for their kids? to trade them to Albania. Unfortunately, Albania is my country, it's a beautiful country. Albanian people are amazing people, but it's proven that the governments are not great in Albania. And right. for the last 10 years, unfortunately, it's proven that it's one of the most corrupted government in Europe. Right. And I would you... not personally send these people there. These people are human beings. They have their rights to be processed in the country. Here well, thank, thank you. You do make an important point, and it's important that we get the tone right on this. You know, I may have seemed a little harsh in my tone about the number of people coming here, and actually, as you point out, these people are exploited by people smugglers, smugglers. and we heard in the clips earlier uh, our Home Secretary, Priti Patel, repeatedly pledging to, to crack down on those people smugglers. And as you say, many of the people coming over are in search of a better life. Uh, what I don't accept is that the majority of these people are fleeing from persecution uh, because, of course, many of them, most of them, have come through a number of safe countries before they actually uh, get to the point at which they're crossing the channel to the UK. Uh, tell me more about the issue with corruption in Albania. If we were to send £100,000 per migrant to Albania, uh, to the Albanian government, would you have any confidence that that money, which would soon stack up to many millions of pounds a week, do you think that money would be well used by the Albanian government? Uh, to be honest, 
I that is my main concern. And uh, what I believe, this will follow a number of tragedies because these people taken to Albania, that's not they want it. They sacrificed their life to come to England. And that's why they have all the rights of this world to be processed in this country. These people that will send back to Albania or send to Albania, these immigrants, they will try to cross the borders again, to cross the Adriatic Sea. And that will bring a numerous of uh, tragedies because we know from history, many immigrants, they try to cross the borders, try to trust, cross the Adriatic and that end up in tragedies. We lost many people in Albania, kids and uh, children, very young children. And I don't want to see this anymore in 2022 happening to the human beings. And uh, to be honest, I do not have faith in Albanian government. And that's, I'm not very proud saying that, but I prefer to say the truth. They will spend a thousand or two thousand pounds for each person and they will make a profit of 98,000 pounds. And well, these indeed. people will be very vulnerable there. And this is not just you. Uh, many international surveys have put Albania right up there uh, amongst the most corrupt countries, uh, certainly in Europe. So it's a real concern that. And Albania does, of course, also have quite strong links, doesn't it, with the Russian regime? And Turkish regime too, unfortunately. But what he really upsets me as a mother, as a woman, as an immigrant myself, is then uh, Mrs. Patel uh, being quite harsh into these people as uh, herself as an immigrant's child. How would she felt if many decades ago when her family moved to England, the government of the time sent her family to be processed in Albania? Mrs. Patel would not have been able to be the lady she is today. She would not have been able to have the education she has today. She would have lived in the same place with me. Unfortunately, in a communist country, and uh, perhaps very lucky to be fed two or three times a day with bread and sugar, and wear the same clothes for 12 months. So I think Pretty Patel, with her background, should look with more sympathy to these people. Thank you very much, uh, Arlinda Balchai, an Albanian who lives in Shrewsbury and is a Conservative Party activist. Well, let me tell you now, my experience as a political journalist tells me that this great Albania scheme is never going to happen. It's a classic case of a government desperately trying to look as if they're doing something. It won't work. And by the way, what's to stop Albania bunging a few quid at a few desperate people of their own and sending them to the UK only to collect their £100,000 payment to bring them home again. Seriously, you could not make this stuff up. After the break, we'll be looking at the public reaction to the lockdown in Austria. But before that, let's take a look at the weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hi there. Colder weather is on the way, but today at least stays very mild. Cloudy for most, and it stays wet in northern Scotland. The exception being Shetland, away from this weather front, but subject to some very strong winds at first today. Those winds easing later, and then this weather front bringing that damp weather to northern Scotland. But elsewhere, closer to high pressure. We've still got this mild but rather cloudy westerly airflow. So a lot of cloud around, but the promise of some breaks in the clouds, some sunshine coming through eastern England into northern England later, northern Ireland, eastern Scotland. And it's a mild day, especially where we get those cloud breaks, temperatures at 13, 14, perhaps even 15 or 16 Celsius there in Aberdeen. Not feeling quite so pleasant where we've got the rain in northern Scotland and staying blustery in Shetland. The rain continues through the evening and overnight in the far north, but further south, we keep the cloud cover. Again, some cloud covering the hills and some spots of rain and drizzle around some western hills and coasts. But on the whole, a dry and relatively mild night, not quite as mild as the last few nights. 
and that wet weather still with us in the far north of Scotland as we begin Saturday. And it comes south, so a spell of rain for Scotland, Northern Ireland during the morning before it then pushes into Northern England and it does clear during the afternoon from Scotland and Northern Ireland with uh, sunny spells and blustery showers replacing it. It stays cloudy, roasty dry, but with a few spots of rain here and there in the south. And 12 to 13 Celsius, a degree or so down compared to today. Here's that area of rain then coming south on Saturday night. It fizzles out somewhat, so not much rain on it, but it does mark a significant change once we clear that cloud. Brighter skies arrive from the north, sunny spells on Sunday for many places, but some showers around coastal areas, it will also be colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. The breaking news this morning is that Austria is to enter a full national lockdown for a maximum period of 20 days, according to its Chancellor. And they're going further. From the 1st of February next year, it will be a legal requirement for citizens to be vaccinated. They are the first country in the world to mandate vaccines for everybody in this way. So joining me now is Freddie Sayers, executive editor of Unheard, who was in Australia, I beg your pardon, Austria even, Austria and Australia, both quite uh, draconian on their measures, but in this case it was Austria earlier this week, making a film about their lockdown for the unvaccinated. Let's have a look. I think it comes much too late. And I think, I think it's very unfair of people who are not for health reasons, not taking a vaccine because that's obvious you know but all the others they're crazy and all the trouble we have is due to those people who believe in I don't know the earth is flat <laughs> so how long would you be happy for them to be stuck at home for uh, I don't think that will help that's the thing but what is what makes me hopeful is that now some of those people who refuse to have a vaccine are now thinking of having second thoughts because they have no access to restaurants, they have no access to theatre or anything. And I know people like that do now all of a sudden they're in a hurry to get a vaccine. So you're not worried that a whole little part of society is just invisible now, stuck at home? If the, if the majority of society depends on idiots, then we can't be helped and that's the end of society. No, no, I don't think. We had it for everybody 
some time to go. So I think it's now for a special group, and they should do it. No, I think it's I think it's the right way because uh, because. Um, uh, the the um, cases are getting higher and higher and higher, and the problems are the non-vaccinated people. So I'm fine with that. Wow. Well, I'm delighted to say that Freddie joins me now. Thank you for coming on GB News, Freddie. Uh, we heard your interviewees there describe people who didn't want to have vaccines as flat earthers, as idiots, and essentially responsible for the situation that Austria finds itself in now. We did hear your first interviewee there uh, say that she didn't think it would work. And in a sense, perhaps she's been right about that because the government has now decided to go one step further and introduce a full national lockdown. Are you surprised about that? And tell us about the atmosphere uh, in Austria when you were out there earlier this week. Well, we just felt we should go and see what it felt like uh, to be in a society where a third of the population had been confined to partial house arrest and everyone else was allowed to go about their daily business. And it was eerie. Uh, the streets were relatively quiet. But the thing that struck me most was how sort of normal people seemed to feel it was. There wasn't a great deal of introspection. As you saw from some of those interviews there, there wasn't a lot of sympathy for the part of society that wasn't unvaccinated. There was a lot of uh, frustration. And the, perhaps the weirdest thing, as you pointed out, is that they didn't even seem to think it would work anyway. Uh, the kind of practical basis for confining only vaccinated, unvaccinated people sort of falls apart when you begin to investigate it. For example, those people who are not vaccinated are still allowed to go to work in this Austrian regime, as long as they have daily tests. So you get the weird situation where cafes and restaurants and hotels are staffed, in many cases, by unvaccinated people, serving vaccinated people. But those same unvaccinated people who have been tested are not allowed to return to the same venues as customers. So they're sort of confined to a serving class. All of these weird side effects of these increasingly desperate policies in terms of the cohesion of society, in terms of other things than COVID, are, don't seem to be factored in. Um, and now we saw, as you said, this morning's development, which is that Austria, after just five days of a, a lockdown for only the unvaccinated, has now upgraded it to lockdown for everyone. So the proof is in the pudding. It didn't work anyway. Well, indeed, um, that hasn't stopped other countries looking at it with a great deal of interest and uh, even thinking of emulating it. Um, in terms of the 20 day lockdown, uh, how do you think uh, people in Austria will react to that? I mean, there seemed to be so much support for kind of getting to grips with their soaring number of cases. Maybe they, they accept it, you know, this quick transition from a vaccine, uh, people who've, who have not had the vaccine being locked up to everybody. Do you think that will have gone down OK? As I said, they're, they're bizarrely philosophical about it and they don't, there's very little outrage. We actually spoke to people who were unvaccinated and who were confined at home and even they seem to be oddly sort of OK with it. Um, there are protests going on in Austria that one of the big opposition parties is called the FPÖ, it's the Freedom Party, and they're making a lot of hay out of this and certainly there is a, a resistance movement, but generally uh, people are sort of going along with it. I think when you look at this position of the UK now versus a lot of these Western European countries where cases are going up and up, and we're now going to see in countries across Europe these kinds of draconian policies coming back in, we're actually looking in a better situation. Uh, and not only we don't have uh, vaccine passports, we don't have mandates like that, um, but it looks like, and I think the obvious deduction is that having allowed higher case levels since the summer, having released most of the restrictions, the UK has allowed us levels of immunity to continue to build up so that we're now, combined with our booster programme, actually looking like in a better position than Europe, which had more kind of draconian uh, policies earlier on. So 
the significance of that is is quite great because all of those arguments that you heard through, since July about how irresponsible it was for the government to be allowing such high levels of infection, they turn out perhaps the opposite was true, and that this the UK's more liberal policy is going to turn out to be the more responsible one. So it's another example of how careful we have to be before we just uh, go along with the narrative. Well, yes, indeed. I mean, one of the interesting things about Austria is that such a significant portion of the population has chosen not to be vaccinated to date. It's about a third, isn't it? Uh, why do you think that is? Is there some kind of historic nervousness there or, or the cultural thing? Or, or what is it that the government has, if you like, failed to do uh, to make the case to that segment of the population? I mean, even by saying it's the government has failed, you, you, one sort of accepts the premise, which is it, it should be up to the government to decide who, who takes these measures and who doesn't. It looks like there is a kind of German, uh, Germanic speaking uh, resistance or hesitancy about vaccines. The, the German uptake is also not especially high. And the politics is also a big part of it. Uh, unlike the UK, unlike most Western European countries, there is a mainstream political party, the Freedom Party, which was actually part of the coalition government until a couple of years ago. Uh, had, you know, the interior minister was from that party who are now very strongly with this, their new uh, leader, Herbert Kickel, uh, really kicking up a lot of fuss about lockdowns, about uh, vaccines, and they are um, increasing that resistance. So the, po the local politics has definitely uh, played into it. And, and just finally, Freddie, um, the Chancellor has said that this is a 20-day national lockdown that's going to be, uh, begin next week. What isn't clear, but perhaps you can tell us the answer, is after the 20 days, is everybody allowed out? Or does it revert to uh, where we are now, which is that the vaccinated are allowed out, but the unvaccinated must stay at home? The policy is being made up on a kind of three-day basis at the moment. So the idea that we know what's going to happen in 20 days, let alone in February, the, the plan in Austria now is that from February onwards, vaccination is going to be mandatory for every citizen. They haven't exactly explained how that will work. It, I suspect it will work in a kind of fines-based system. But who knows who will even be in power that far away? I mean, things are moving so quickly. Um, and, you know, I think the, the important point to try and digest is that at some point, governments are going to have to accept that there is a limit to what they can do to micromanage the spread of every virus and to offer your citizens the vaccine to make sure that you've taken responsible steps is the main thing. And beyond that, there is a certain degree to which nature has a role. Uh, and it looks like we're beginning to come to terms with that here in the UK. But across the continent of Europe, they're a long way behind on that. Oh, well, thank you, Freddie. I hope uh, that your optimism for this country proves to be well founded. That was Freddie Sayers there, who's the executive editor of Unheard. Uh, and I should just say that for full transparency, that the interim chairman of GB News, Paul Marshall, is also an investor in Unheard. Plenty more still to come after the break. We'll be taking uh, a look at where this new great global Britain stands in the world. What is the place of our country in the world? But first, it's the news with Rhiannon Jones. I'm Rhiannon Jones. Here are the latest headlines. Counter-terrorism police have confirmed the bomb which exploded outside the Liverpool Women's Hospital on Sunday had been packed with ball bearings. They say it could have caused significant injury or death had it exploded in the way the bomber intended. An investigation is underway after two women and two children died following a house fire in Bexley Heath in south-east London. The victims were rescued from the first floor but all died at the scene. The fire is not thought to be suspicious. The UK is banning Hamas, designating it a terrorist organisation. The move brings British policy in line with the EU and the US. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, says Hamas has significant terrorist capability that includes access to extensive and sophisticated weaponry and terrorist training facilities. Supporters of the Palestinian Islamist group could face up to 10 years in prison. 
COVID booster jabs are being added to the travel pass. Millions of people who've had three doses can now prove their status with the NHS app. It means people can visit countries where vaccinations are only valid for a certain amount of time without having to quarantine. Austria will enter a national lockdown from Monday for at least 10 days. Unvaccinated citizens were told to stay at home last month, but Chancellor Alexander Schollenberg says nationwide restrictions are now needed to try and contain a fourth wave of COVID cases. From next autumn, schools in England will be required to help keep uniform costs down. They'll be instructed to remove unnecessary branded items under new Department for Education guidance. Schools will also have to make sure second-hand uniform forms are available. I'll be back with a full update at the top of the hour. See you then. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. The UK is the fifth or sixth biggest economy in the world, depending how you measure it. We're one of the oldest democracies in the world. We have one of the most powerful armed forces in the world, or at least we did until fairly recently. And we're still one of the most influential nations on the planet. But for how long? Do you ever worry that we're losing our way, that we might be going down and not up in the world? Well, this week, a report on global prosperity confirmed just that. Over a period of years, we seem to have been on the slide. Nothing too drastic, but according to the research by the think tank, the Legatum Institute, which is an investor in GB News, the UK have fallen over the years from 11th to 13th most prosperous country in the world. So with me to talk about this report is Stephen Bryan, De Director of Policy at the Legatum Institute. Uh, Stephen, thank you uh, for coming in. Now, this is a very substantial piece of work. You do this every year, don't you? You look at every, pretty much every country in the world and rank them on prosperity. Can you explain what prosperity means? How is that defined? Yeah. Well, thank you, Isabel. We look at prosperity in a much wider way than simply GDP. We think about the outcomes in terms of people's lived experience, their health, their education, their living conditions, the quality of the environment, but also upstream. What are the social institutional structures that are needed to actually have a good society? Things like levels of freedom, governance, crime, levels of social capital. And in that sense, as you say, the UK over the last few years has slipped a few places. But much more interesting is actually when you get under the surface of it. Right. So here, we see that, obviously, with the pandemic, there have been big impacts in terms of economic quality, mm -hmm. deteriorations in employment, which, thank goodness, is bouncing back, 
But in terms of inflation and the uh, level of debt, these have deteriorated significantly. And of course, obviously, health as well has been a major issue. And what about uh, in terms of freedoms? Um, obviously, the conditions associated with COVID lockdowns will have distorted uh, your data quite significantly, but I suppose they applied all over the world. They, they, they did, and actually the, the trends of freedoms that we saw in the last year or so through the lockdowns are actually merely a continuation of a longer term and more worrying trend around right. the world, where freedom of speech and freedom of assembly in particular have actually been on a steady slide across, across the world. Nearly 100 countries have actually reduced their freedoms over the last four or five years. And when it comes to freedom of speech, which I think is something that matters a great deal uh, to our viewers, uh, and certainly to me as, as a journalist, um, is that defined quite tightly in your research according to whether you're likely to be arrested for saying certain things against a government? Or do you look at things like sort of cancel culture and whether it's really feasible, realistically, for people to be able to say what they think? We look at it in quite a broad way. So absolutely, there are the very well-known characteristics about the freedom of journalists to be able to report, but also looking at the diversity of news that people have access to and uh, their ability to access news from, from abroad. I think we don't quite yet have international measures on things like cancel culture, but we do try by getting a test on the diversity of news sources to, to make sure people do get access to a variety of views. So looking at Britain and, and the UK's place in the world and, and perhaps even in Europe, um, I think people would be interested to know which countries are coming out at the very top of the prosperity index. Certainly when I looked at the rankings, I was quite surprised to see uh, which it was. So Denmark is number one. And in general, the Nordic countries like Norway, Sweden, Finland all do very well, as does Switzerland. Well, what's so great about Denmark? I think what Denmark has managed to do is to actually have a very balanced combination of a good economy. And they've always had a very open economy. While they're often thought of as having a major amount of redistribution, they are actually a very entrepreneurial and open economy. That, combined with good institutions and good governance, means that the wealth they generate gets deployed into people's well-being. So they really have found a nice sweet spot of balancing institutions, economics and social well-being. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Well, we all know where we're going to be booking our holidays next year. Thank you, uh, Stephen Bryan, uh, here from the uh, Legatum Institute to talk about your fantastic uh, prosperity index. Thank you. Now, one country that is going up, not down, in these areas is Botswana. Earlier this week, I spoke to their president about how this sub-Saharan country is becoming something of a regional success story. Your Excellency, you're beginning to look beyond the pandemic now in Botswana, but how are things uh, with COVID-19 now? Well, we've had, uh, I think, a period uh, uh, that was uh, pretty bad, and uh, it's looking much better right now. Right. Uh, the incidence rate has gone down, the mortality rate is declining, and the prevalence is also plateauing, if not declining. Uh, we had a lockdown that was pretty strict a number of times. And um, we did something quite unusual for a democratic free country. Um, given our statutes, including our basic law, in our view, we arrived at the opinion that was not shared by everybody, including the opposition, um, that we ought to invoke the provisions of the constitution and therefore institute a, a state of public emergency. And uh, we had that uh, renewed because it can last a maximum of six months at a time, uh, three times. So we had a total period of 18 months of a state of emergency in order to use it for peaceful purposes to effectively and without harm to the economy, any more harm to the economy, to restrict the movement of persons. In the UK now, we're beginning our program of booster jabs. This is a third vaccine for most people. Whereas in sub-Saharan Africa and many other parts of the world, many people haven't even had their first jab. How do you feel about that? No, I think that uh, uh, I want to applaud the UK government for doing what the science informs them is the best thing to do. But I also want to be critical of the inability, including others, developed countries where vaccines are produced, the inability to sufficiently share because arithmetically, even if you count it, given the production rates right now, 
there is enough to be more shared uh, without compromising uh, the need for third uh, wave vaccines in the first world. So I think there's a little more sensitivity uh, called for uh, and inclusiveness called for. And so on that score, uh, we feel pretty bad that uh, uh, not enough has been shared. And, you know, we are prepared to pay for, for these, um, but uh, we, we think that uh, the responsible thing is a global citizen to do. You know, uh, if, if you have vaccines required by the science in order to protect an individual, irrespective of age, that is the moral right thing to do for any government. So if I were in the UK as a citizen or in government, and the scientists advise that we vaccinate children, I would do it. I applaud them for doing that. The difference I'm making is that if you counted the number of vaccines being produced, the output, there's enough to vaccinate the children, the adults, even third round in the UK and other places, and share with the other countries that do not have an opportunity to have a first jab. So Botswana has done quite well in the Global Prosperity Index that's been published by the Legatum Institute this week. And they've done particularly well going up the rankings in terms of personal freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. What have you been doing to prioritize those areas? It's something we cherish and it's part of our DNA. We're a multi-party democracy, the oldest in Africa, I might add, since independence. But even predating independence, we were a people of a free spirit. There is an adage in our customary assembly systems that loosely translated means that everyone is free to say as they please. Um, and the, the words or views around an assembly are all acceptable. Um, and so it is uh, not surprising that uh, we are perceived to be uh, free and we have a, a free and vibrant press. The only thing we'd like is to find out what it is that we're not doing sufficiently well for us to be right up there. Well, I think I can help you on where Botswana may have not scored so highly in the global index. Uh, one thing that I picked out was on the environment. Apparently, Botswana went a little bit down in those rankings. Could you explain perhaps why you think that might be? I, I cannot attribute any one thing except perhaps a human intrusion as populations grow. Mm. But we will take a harder look at it to find out uh, what were the determinants of that uh, scoring? Unfortunately, the UK has actually slipped down the global rankings. As you look at the UK now, and you'll be aware that we've had uh, quite a lot of soul searching post the decision to leave the EU, how do you feel about Britain's place in the world? Do you think that the UK will become a more or less important country? Uh, the United Kingdom is made up of people who are resilient and uh, dynamic. Um, and if you look at uh, uh, the history of the world, uh, they've had much to contribute to civilization. I have no doubt that the United Kingdom uh, should bounce back and project leadership in many spheres. Uh, we do look to it for its learning institutions, research, the track record of what is achieved. And uh, it's a question, I think, of uh, doing more soul searching and just getting on with it. Botswana is a member of the Commonwealth. Now, quite a lot of Commonwealth countries are now saying that they are interested in leaving the Commonwealth. They feel that it's a tie to a colonial past. Do you see Botswana ever going down that route? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I just think we ought to uh, club together and make our organisation more relevant and responsive to our needs. And it seems that you weren't at COP26. Were you tempted to attend the climate change conference in Glasgow? Unfortunately, as is provided for in our system, when the annual year of parliament begins, um, it starts with an address to the nation by the head of state. It's commonly known as a state of the nation address. And I have to deliver that. So it coincided with the preparations for that and the delivery of that. So the reason I didn't go was simply Timing. because of that, yeah. And what did you think of the outcome of COP26? Do you feel that it achieved much? And, and what did it mean for your country? 
Well, the fact that people agree to congregate and meet and reflect is in itself a success. What they reflected on and what they realized may not be as successful as they may have wished. But clearly, in terms of their actions, particularly those countries that contribute the most to emissions, uh, it could be predictable before the, the conference that it was not going to achieve what it uh, intended in that score. I would just like to ask you, if we were to have this interview again in a year's time, what would you hope to have achieved? Well, I'd have hoped that Botswana will have ramped up in its uh, rankings and the prosperity index. Um, and I wish Britain too, all the goodwill for it to have uh, done, to do better than it has done this time. And, um, uh, and uh, I, I hope that uh, there'd be uh, much more learning between ourselves and the Legatum Institute as, as we share. But the rest I'll leave for what I have to say tonight. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I thought that was particularly interesting in relation to what he had to say about the distribution of vaccines as we push everybody to get their third booster jab. Uh, obviously, many parts of Africa still struggling to give their populations a first vaccine. Now it's time for the latest instalment of my very special interview series, The Cause, where we talk to people about a campaign or charity that matters to them. And today we're focusing on bearskin. The black bearskin hats worn by the Queen's Guard are one of the most iconic sights in London. Tourists love them, but what about the bears? In 2019, the Queen's official dresser revealed that she would no longer wear real animal fur. Instead, new outfits would be made with faux fur. But the ceremonial guards and beef eaters at the Tower of London still wear bearskin hats made of real fur from black bears killed in Canada. They're very expensive and associated with significant cruelty. Now, animal welfare campaigners PETA have offered to provide exact replicas made of fake fur for free. With me to tell us more about this is Katie Werner, Senior Campaigns Manager at PETA. Katie, uh, thanks for coming in. Tell us what this is all about then. I didn't realise uh, that these hats were actually associated with real animal cruelty. Can you tell us why? Yeah, so every year um, the government uh, funds the slaughter of uh, black bears in Canada. The UK um, government? Yeah, to produce um, bearskin hats for the Queen's Guard. Um, and so Peter with Ecopel, a faux furrier, have developed the Look world's first faux bear wow. fur um, that looks and uh, feels and performs the same way yes. as the real bear skin. I have to say, it cats. feels lovely, doesn't it? It's like yeah. sort of, we've got a pet here on, yeah. the, on the table. <laughs> yeah, it's fully um, waterproof and durable, and um, we're asking the MOD to start developing the caps with the faux fur. And tell me, I'm just wondering about the weight of this. Oh, it's nice and light, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. Because so... one of the issues with the real ones, um, I don't know whether it's the fur that's causing the weight, probably not, but they are quite heavy to wear, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they really are. Um, so we won't see any guards, you know, fainting on the parade ground wearing these because they're very lightweight, as you say. They're durable, they're waterproof, and we don't need to be killing bears anymore for what is an ornamental hat. So tell us about the, the annual bear hunt, as it is, in, um, in Canada. Is that something that the Canadian government says needs to be done in some way to control the bear population? Well, we know that culling animals doesn't work. Um, and the, as we said, the UK government is funding this cull, which is completely at odds with you know, the British public's opinion. I mean, when you say they're funding it, um, do you mean they're helping prop it up by buying the product? Yes. Or, yeah. Right, so sort yeah. of, um, yes, enabling it, contributing to it in yes, some way. They're exactly. not actually saying, here's some money, go and kill some bears, to be fair. No, but the government um, you know, pays for the pelts, um, mm -hmm. and these bears, one in seven will escape the hunters wounded, right. so we'll have a horrible, prolonged death. Right. Um, and some will be mothers who will, um, obviously then all of their cubs will also die, um, starve because they've lost their mum. So it's, yeah, completely cruel and completely unjustifiable when we have an amazing alternative um, that doesn't cause any animals to die. And has Peter actually observed this bear hunt or do you rely on evidence coming in from Canadian sources or how do you know about the, the suffering that has gone into the 
real uh, beef eater hats. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's well documented um, right. and we have footage of, um, of hunts um, like that. Um, so we know, yeah, we know that. So it's... you've offered these things, which I just keep wanting to straight for some reason. <laughs> um, you've offered these things to the MOD. Yes. Um, have you had any response? Uh, well, that's a really good question. I mean, we haven't yet, um, but really there is no reason for them to continue killing bears for these hats. These hats, um, if they go ahead with the faux fur, uh, it will be supplied to them for free by Ecopel, the faux furrier, until 2030, um, which will save the taxpayer thousands of pounds. In the last seven years, the government spent over a million on these hats. Wow. Um, and each one costs around £1,300. So, I mean, it's just an incredible saving. And, and we'll save Very briefly, lives. you've got a celebrity endorsement for this campaign today, Pamela Anderson. Yes, a long-time supporter. Are you going to get her in one of these with a red swimming suit on? Or... <laughs> Do you want to come and work for our campaign, Steve? That's uh, a great well, idea. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to put it on because I think the size matters, doesn't it, with these ones? So yeah, we're not gonna, totally. we're not going to put you through that. Well, listen, thank you very much for Thanks coming for in and me. talking about these great bits of kit. Yeah. You've been watching The Briefing with me, Isabella Oakshot. The show is back every weekday from noon. Up next, it's On The Money with Liam Halligan. But for now, I'll leave you with your weather forecast. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hi there. Colder weather is on the way, but today at least stays very mild. Cloudy for most and it stays wet in northern Scotland. The exception being Shetland, away from this weather front, but subject to some very strong winds at first today, those winds easing later, and then this weather front bringing that damp weather to northern Scotland. But elsewhere, closer to high pressure, we've still got this mild but rather cloudy westerly airflow. So a lot of cloud around, but the promise of some breaks in the clouds, some sunshine coming through eastern England into northern England later, northern Ireland, eastern Scotland. And it's a mild day, especially where we get those cloud breaks, temperatures at 13, 14, perhaps even 15 or 16 Celsius there in Aberdeen. Not feeling quite so pleasant where we've got the rain in northern Scotland and staying blustery in Shetland. The rain continues through the evening and overnight in the far north, but further south, we keep the cloud cover. Again, some cloud covering the hills and some spots of rain and drizzle around some western hills and coasts but on the whole a dry and relatively mild night, not quite as mild as the last few nights. And that wet weather still with us in the far north of Scotland as we begin Saturday. And it comes south, so a spell of rain for Scotland, Northern Ireland during the morning before it then pushes into Northern England. And it does clear during the afternoon from Scotland and Northern Ireland with uh, sunny spells and blustery showers replacing it. It stays cloudy, roasty dry, but with a few spots of rain here and there in the south and 12 to 13 Celsius, a degree or so down compared to today. Here's that area of rain then coming south on Saturday night. It fizzles out somewhat, so not much rain on it, but it does mark a significant change once we clear that cloud. Brighter skies arrive from the north, sunny spells on Sunday for many places, but some showers around coastal areas, it will also be colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. 
we have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Welcome once again to On The Money, your daily weekday dose of economics, business and consumer news. I'm Liam Halligan and it's a bumper edition today because for the next two hours we'll be talking about banks reimbursing scam victims and why Amazon has stopped accepting Visa credit cards. It's a jam